All right, there's no time like the present. Here we are, breaking news update. <laughs> the great Brian last here, you there, and of course, Jim Cornette here. You'll hear this on the drive through or on YouTube. I'm not here, I'm here. You're there. You're over there, I'm over here now, and of course... Where are they? CM Punk was on Ariel Hawani's MMA Hour, and the listeners are blowing up our notifications saying they want to hear what you think of this. Again, it... <sighs> It's an ex it's a testament, ladies and gentlemen, to the newsworthiness of our friend CM Punk. That not when he talks, not only does he draw ratings, not only does he create controversy, not only do people want to know what he has to say, but it's to the point now where people want to know what other people have to say about what CM Punk said, and the people are demanding. And I guess there's some ulterior motive in their demands brian because a lot of what cm punk says validated and or confirmed some of the things that we've been saying and or the flavor of those things about the smear campaign against him about the general lack of leadership and structure and organization and discipline as in the romper room kind of discipline over in AEW as a company and about the way some people feel about the business. And it was, we, we've got some audio clips, and I, I, but I've got to see, you got to listen to this whole thing. Ariel Hawani hasn't paid me a, a dime here, but it was a two-hour conversation on the MMA Hour. You can find it all over YouTube and everything. And Ariel is the host. We encourage you to go listen to this thing because there's no way that we could recap everything. But I'll tell you, my general takeaway was it was refreshing. Brian, how long has it been to hear whether an interview on TV or a shoot interview or a, a, a out of character, as the kids say, interview on a mainstream program where somebody in the wrestling business in the modern era actually talked about the wrestling business like an adult? Like people in the wrestling business used to talk instead of, oh, it was always my dream to be in the, the, the WWE, and so me and my friend got together, and we thought of a bunch of, of wild stunts, and we put our bodies on the line so that the fans would roar, and we got a five-star match, and oh, it was so great. Instead, he's saying, hey, this business is about selling tickets and drawing viewers, and if you're more happy that some goof says you had a five-star match in a building a quarter full, then we're in a different business. And he he was articulate, well-spoken about a variety of topics or just an interesting conversationalist there, not a raving lunatic bouncing off the walls screaming, I'll choke you out! But also, he, this is the difference between a star in the mainstream wrestling business and these guys that got their smoke blown up their ass on the indies. They understand that there's things that they need to learn and processes they need to go through until they figure the business, understand the goal of the business. And he has done that and respects it the right way and understands what his place is in it and how he can move uh, the needle, as they say, instead of going out there jacking around with his buddies that nobody gives a shit about doing stupid shit to entertain themselves. And it's not just, there's a lot of people that fit that category and not many people that I think that can sound as, as well-spoken and professional and as clear-headed and reasonable and explain the wrestling business to the layman without exposing every goddamn dirty little nook and cranny of it. But it's a business and it's a professional sport. It's not playtime with the lollipop guild that was that was my refreshing comment that was your refreshing comment you're declaring that my, your, your own comment is refreshing no that was that was my that was my comment on why it was refreshing for me to hear that is what i'm trying to say all right well to you funny enough it was a refreshing comment so you win on both counts well it was almost a fresca you know i watched it too and i have to say i was afraid for my life I've been watching wrestling interviews for so many years, I've never felt so much fear in my life. That's because this place is a joke and you're a clown and I quit. You know, and I think part of the story, we'll talk a little bit about it later on, has been 
you know, the usual suspects, the reaction from the Ninny fans, from, quite frankly, the Tony Khan kind of fans out there. If Tony wasn't a billionaire's son, these are the fans that are on the message boards with him. Weak-minded, don't understand the business, believe anything that's said to them by the people they like. And earlier that day, I don't know if you got a chance to see it, a lot of the listeners were sending it over. Punk and Randy Orton did a watch-along of their old WrestleMania match from whatever, 2012, 2011, I forget. I, I heard that happened, but I have not seen it. You need to see it, because they talk about the fact that they did not like each other. They had issues. Punk caught Randy Orton running his mouth on him to Arn Anderson. <laughs> walked in on it. And you know what? They ended up making money together, and it all worked out. Now they're sitting there like old war buddies, having a great time. You need to see it. Because it's kind of the difference between the wrestling business and Tony Khan's dad-funded hobby, which is all it is. And we'll talk more about that stuff a little bit later on, but fascinating interview. Went on for a long time. Yes, I, it, it was the same length as an episode of SmackDown, but it took longer to watch because you didn't want to fast forward through anything. Although I, I zipped out a little bit early when the lightning and thunder started and I was wearing the headphones. I figured, well, I don't want to go to old Sparky just to hear Punk's closing comments, but I got the, 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 the main portion of it. And, you know, that's he, he touched on a lot of stuff. Uh, obviously, there's an NDA on the, the, the what are they, the brawl out, the... The big, the big uh, dressing room kerfluffle. And so it, 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 Ariel Hawani asked him, he said, well, why did, uh, why did you sign an NDA on this? He said, I didn't sign an NDA for anything that I did wrong. Well, why'd you sign an NDA? Well, you'll have to ask Tony because he's the one that wanted me to do. <laughs> yeah, he'd love to be able to tell people what happened in that room. There's a reason why Tony Khan and AEW don't want people talking about the behavior of the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Mega Parik, and everyone involved in that affair. And it's and not so, CM Punk. So that, but that's the only, because he doesn't have an NDA on uh, Wembley and old Jungle Jack off. And not only that, but he revealed he didn't have a no compete. They fixed it up. They, I'm talking about the, the elite and their ilk, fixed it to where the Tony ended up firing his biggest star and at the same time letting him go free and clear so that he could join the opposition anytime he wanted. And, I mean, we don't know the particulars. I understand Punk has a good attorney. His number is 877-50-STEVE. But uh, he might have, you know, might have got a little bonus just to just go away. You're upsetting my friends. And the, the, the fact that that he is now punk is now in the position he's in and Tony and his friends are in the position they're in. It's a, what the fuck with friends like that? You don't need enemas. See, here's the deal. Punk went in there, no matter what you think of him or what side you're on in terms of what wrestlers you like, Punk went in there thinking, I'm going to work with Tony Khan, who's professing how much he loves me, and I'm going to try to make this place great, and I'm going to try to produce great stuff, and I'm going to, at this point in my life, let alone my career that I'm returning to, be able to help people. I mean, you could tell in this interview, he kept referring to himself as Phil the Booker. He thinks a lot about this. This isn't just a job. When you're really in deep, it's in your head all day. It's in his head. And he wants to be able to do more. And he said the same thing that people that talk to me who love Tony Khan as a human being, love him, say to me, which is that he's a tremendously nice guy and he's not a boss in any way. And I've always said it from day one. You can go back. We've been saying all these things before anyone else jumped on him. Tony Khan's a nice guy. He's not a boss. He's not capable of doing the job of being a boss. We'll talk about it on the drive through when we return from time travel. I think it, the quote was, he's not a boss, he's a nice guy, and that's a detriment to the company. You know, it's funny enough, the day this interview comes out, AEW released a bunch of wrestlers or a bunch of wrestling personnel. <laughs> well, I don't know if... We might read the list. I, I, I'm going to say wrestlers loosely at this point. Well, there's just the idea that no one ever got released and all of a sudden 
the day that the issue kind of comes up a little bit in this interview, there's a bunch of releases. Well, but at the same, these names have not been seen in public by their own families in fucking months. It's like they were held hostage somewhere. Well, a few of them so, have been seen. A few of them have. Well, God, if, if, if they've had a job for two or three years or whatever, that was a fucking gift. What is this, make a wish? But again, a lot of the point of all of this is the center of all this drama is Tony Khan. And again, you hear people saying, I saw a couple of comments that were just so ignorant and stupid online, that what Punk is saying here is wrong because it's never been about the ratings or anything. It was about getting the big TV rights renewal. But that's like, Vince, <laughs> but that's like when Vince Russo used to say, it doesn't matter that the pay-per-views are dropping and attendances are low. My job is the ratings. He's well, saying but, in this interview, he was trying to make this a real company. That's not what it's there for. We've said it from day one. It was Shad Khan throwing a bunch of money at his son so he would shut up about wrestling, and then he could have his wrestling company hopefully make a profit somehow. And the, the problem, again, is you don't get the, the, for the people, oh, it's about the renewal. Well, you, if you don't have any ratings, you don't get the renewal or the big renewal or the, the raise in the renewal. And... Again, it's it's two different mindsets. The, the reason why the Lollipop Guild, the Trampoline Cowboys as a whole, work with any kind of audience is because on the indie level, they were allowed to, because they had no bosses and no structure and nobody to tell them what to do. They were allowed to do, as we've talked about many times, whatever the fuck they wanted to do, which made up for their lack of size or their lack of promo ability or their lack of personality or, in many cases, their lack of talent. But that doesn't sell to the mainstream. It sells to the hardcore nerd fans like Tony Khan. And it just happens that that's the first time that one of these hardcore nerd fans has had a billionaire father that wanted to finance anything. We've had some lottery winners, but th so then these guys get paid a fortune by a mark because he thinks that he can translate what they want to see in rec centers to what they want to see in NBA arenas. And it don't work that way. And they found that out, but the dipshits, are scared to admit it and acknowledge it, so instead they find other people for Tony to be concerned with or make problems with or whatever to keep him distracted from the obvious, clear, empirical data in front of his eyes. In my opinion. Yeah, for the people saying that nothing matters except for the television rights deal, what about the ratings that are going down every week? You can't blame that on just people dropping cable. Raw and SmackDown are not having this problem. It's an AEW problem. The other excuse you hear, and we'll probably talk about this more in detail on the show, but I heard Dave Meltzer say it. One of the reasons AEW is struggling is because WWE's hot. Oh, good lord. That because they're hot, it takes everything away from AEW. Okay, that's only contradicted by the Monday Night Wars, by the promotional war in Detroit and Indianapolis between the Sheik and the Bruiser, by it... <laughs> Of, the Monday Night was, Wars is the best example of what happened to the old saying. It's, but I mean, it's been going on for fifty years in the rest, or more than that, in the wrestling business. The rising tide lifts all boats, except when one of the boats has a fucking hole in it, right? And no stars. But let's go to some audio, and there's a lot. So we're going to go to the section. We're going to start with because it's one of the things everyone's talking about. Jim, CM Punk, London. All in, Wembley Stadium, the incident with Jack Perry. Stop this. Let me know when you want to say something. There's a lot of audio here to play. I'll raise my hand. Once again, this is CM Punk talking with Ariel Hawani on the MMA. Is it the MMA hour? The MMA hour. But it, it lasted four hours. No, because the uh, YouTube page says MMA fighting on SBN. But I believe it's the MMA hour. Let's go to this. That's the way it was sold to me. August of 2023. London. You arrive in London. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about this. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> How does that go? What happens? Um, there's nobody there to pick me up. And it's not a big deal. I just got on the tube and I was like, adventure. You know? And you have then, to figure it out for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, but that part was fun. 
but it's completely irresponsible as a company to, you know, leave somebody stranded at the airport. But, you know, I, I, I understand the sentiments. You know, people, you know, all the smarties on Twitter, like, oh, can't you just take an Uber? Will you big cry, baby? I never cried about it once. Not once. How do people find out about these things? That's well, there were fans on the, the, oh, the tube. Okay. They're, they're taking yes. pictures. Yes. I mean, you know, like I'm sitting there, I'm just sitting on the tube, and I'm just like, this is yeah, neat. Hey, yeah, hey, 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 just, just real quick. Brian, how think how easy you think it is to find an Uber in a foreign country to take you to a goddamn eighty thousand seat stadium for a major event, and you're the fucking star? What do you think would happen if Mick Jagger pulled up in front of the goddamn stadium in a fucking Uber, and the people saw him? Well, I don't know. I mean, you can get Ubers anywhere. It's a pretty long drive from Heathrow into town. Well, no, that's but... what I'm saying. Is they left him floating around? And how are you going to get an Uber to go to Wembley Stadium in the middle of a giant event when you're the star of it and get in? And they, there's it, Punk is, I'm sure, worked Wembley Stadium many times. I've been in this position. Where the fuck am I supposed to go? It's a goddamn stadium. I'm on the show. Tell the fucking parking guy, let me in. It's bullshit. He's the biggest star they got in a foreign country, and they can't even send anybody to pick him up to the airport. Let's go back to more audio. Tony's big idea was separate show. We're going to separate everybody. And I said, that'll never work. Just let me go. Just get me out of here. Just pay me my money. I, like, um, I'm, I've already been off TV. I, I hurt this arm. Just, just get me out of here. You know, no, I can't let you go. Why? Just let me go. Who cares? I'm, I'm, it's, it's best. I mean, they, these guys don't want me here. This, this, isn't, <laughs> this isn't a real business. This isn't a business predicated on making money, drawing money, selling tickets, you know, doing business. It's, it's, it's not what it was sold to me as. So let me go. Oh, I can't let you go. Hey, hold Let's on. stop yes. it there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> because, well, first of all, what would you think if you were a responsible adult that had put this much money into a venture or a project or a business and the biggest name that you have that has been the one that's drawn the the biggest numbers for you tells you flat out he thinks your business is a fucking joke? Would you not ask, why do you think that? Tell me in detail for hours so I can fix it instead of, oh, no, no, no. Because Tony thinks he has all the answers. That's the problem. You have to be able to admit you're wrong and admit there's a problem. I mean, it's like drug addiction or anything else. You have to be able to admit yourself that there's a problem. But do you think Tony you address it? Do you think Tony knows deep down, but he just doesn't want to admit to Punk verbally that yeah, I know that they're assholes, and because he's there, they're his friends too, and then they'll be mad at him. No, does I he know this or he's just oblivious? I think Tony is a son of the observer. And he thinks he knows the right way based on everything he has read without any direct institutional knowledge or anything. And because a lot of people who know better, instead of saying, Tony, you're not good at this. Why are you doing this? The locker room isn't a great place. Like there's all sorts of issues. Instead, it's here's what Tony needs to do to improve. Or AEW doesn't have a problem. WWE is hot. Like all these different excuses, mm. instead of, Tony Khan is not good at booking. He's good at matchmaking for pay-per-views with New Japan stars, but I think a lot of people could do that. A, well, lot, of people could, a lot of people could say, oh, gee, who would Takeshita have a great match in the ring with for 20 minutes where they go back and forth? Let me see. That's easy to do. But now, wait, but now, wait a minute. He's not a great matchmaker because he's also had Ishii going 20 minutes with whoever, and that ain't, that ain't, any good, brother. But but here's another thing. Punk said, this was not what it was sold to me as. Now, I may blame Punk in part for probably not watching enough AEW before he agreed to, because, boy, if he'd seen it every week in its brutal, grisly clarity like we have, he might not have fallen for this, but they probably sold him on the idea that he would be having control of his stuff and be able to do what he thought to increase the ratings, sell the tickets, whatever, which he did at first, especially until they started doing everything they could, including on air to sabotage him. But anyway, let's go back to this Wembley story. I'm going to do this new show. You're going to, you know, you're going to have blah, blah, blah. And then the second day we have this show, I'm sitting in catering, minding my own business. And Tony Schiavone comes. In. Now, come on, that's our line. 
<laughs> Minding my own business. <laughs> I wasn't even there. <laughs> Tony Schiavone came up to him, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, can I, I really need your help? And I was like, what? He's like, Jack is, you know, cussing me out and he's cussed out Mike Mansuri and he cussed out Daryl from production and he's cussing out the doctor right now. Why? What? And, and I was immediately like, dude isn't supposed to be here. You know, I was told the sh people are getting separated, so there's not problems and you don't want me involved in this because just like everything else I've explained before, like y'all need to handle this because if you don't, I'm going to handle it and you're not going to like the way I handle it. Let me stop it there for a second. Before the whole thing with Punk and Jack Perry, before this one and then Wembley, how's Jack Perry get away with cursing out the producer of the show? The doctor? He's just cursing out everyone backstage? Tony Schiavone, who Mike used, to it, used to it from the old days, but <laughs> um, because, well, I guess he figures he's untouchable because he's from California along with the rest of the Raisins. Prophetic words. <laughs> so he's begging me. Now, please, he drags me out of catering. I go up. Um, uh, Hook and Jack are doing uh, an angle. I don't know anything about Jack going on vacation. All I know is there's a litany of people that um, don't want, they, they work one day a week and they don't want to. So they want to show up and wrestle and then film vignettes and then sit at home for four weeks. Great. Not my company. Do what you want. But not on my show. That was my attitude. So I, I said, Tony, do you really want me doing this? Yeah. And I walked up to Jack and he was sitting in a car. What he wanted to do, it was a rental car. What he wanted to do was smash the window of the rental car with a pipe. And I was just like, it's a rental car. <laughs> and I very politely, because I like Jack, I was just like, Doc's told you no, Daryl's told you no, Mike's told you no, Shivani's told you no, and now I have to tell you no. And apparently you've cussed them all out. So I'm telling you no. We don't do that here. If you want to do this, go to Wednesday and do it. Right? You know, we've just talked so much about double standards. And, you know, you've said it, and CM Punk actually even said it in this interview about The Rock. You know, there are double standards when it comes to top guys in the business. Even Punk said, I think I have one. Top guy. For Jack Perry to behave like this when he's not someone who moves anything. Like, he's not a draw. He's not a ratings draw. He's not a pay-per-view draw. He's not a merch seller. He's not a star beyond the mid-card. How does a guy like, see, I mean, I can understand why people said like, oh, it was petty for them to kick guys out of the show. I can understand why you didn't want certain guys around an environment that was trying to be different. But, it, well, he was comfortable, Jack Perry. He was comfortable because his friends, the EVPs, had told him, oh, you're fine, you're good, you can do whatever because you're figured in with us. And he sees the way Tony sets examples and he figured and... Probably nothing bad would have happened to him if, uh, you know, if, if Tony would either said, oh, go to your locker room, Jack, when he came, or anything, whatever, but Tony wouldn't do anything. But go ahead. And by the way, this is collision. Tony Khan was there, right? I mean, he uh, hasn't well, been brought up in this story, but you have to figure he was in the building. One would think he's always there, but nobody's actually said that he had any interaction whatsoever. And nobody went to him to do anything. All right, back to Punk on the MMA hour. And he had no problem. He said, okay. He said, well, I just thought it was a really cool idea. And I said, it might be, but this is a rental car. The boys ruin it for the boys. You're going to smash the window of a rental car, and you're going to return it with no fucking window, and now whatever <laughs> national <laughs> budget hurts, whatever is going to be and like, by, by, don't. By, by the way, by the way. You've talked about this with hotels and stuff. Well, also, that was a fucking thing that happened in Columbus, Ohio in 1982 or whatever. 80, whenever they started going from Georgia to Ohio for the northern tours, Tommy Rich wrecked so many cars from, I don't know if it was Budget or Hertz or what company it was, that they, they quit uh, renting to wrestlers. And it was a pain in the, and I think more than one, maybe company. And they, it was a pain in the ass for guys to get around up there because guys kept fucking wrecking the cars. Well, Jim, let's return to CM Punk talking about the backstage incident or getting to the backstage incident at Wembley Stadium with Jack Perry. Match is over. He goes to the back. What happens? 
I went I went to Tony and I was just like which Tony by the way Con. Tony Khan okay and I was like please handle that like please and he was like what do you want me to do and I was like I'm not telling you what to do just be the boss please stop right there there you, you go what do you want me to do would you ever say that to when you ran a wrestling <laughs> company would, you, would Bill Watts say that if someone came out would any wrestling promoter say that only if the wrestling promoter agreed with it and wanted to get rid of the guy that was fucking complaining about it. Uh, otherwise, no, it's ridiculous. And that's a th that's why I said when we talked about it before, I would have been the one standing in front of fucking Punk with my finger in Perry's face, firing him first before Punk could snatch him if I was the boss. But Tony's the boss. And Tony said, what do you want me to do? Like, I'm tired of this shit, you know? Like, I told you this was a mistake, and I told you separate shows wasn't going to work, and now we're all here, and, you know, like, it, please handle it. Because if you don't, you're not going to like the way I handle it. Did he handle it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you did. Yeah. What happened? <sighs> Jack came back from his match. I was the next match. I'm sitting there. And I got... I got people with me. I'm not going to say who they are, you know, because I got a lot of friends who work there and I, I, I wish them all well and I don't, don't want them to be punished because they're friends with me, you know. What does that tell you? The fact that he thinks his friends could get punished in AEW? Well, I mean, it's fairly obvious, isn't it? That if the Cucamonga Kids' campaign to rid the cancer of the locker room of CM Punk was successful, if you get rid of Punk, you can get rid of about anybody, can't you? They've got Tony by the fucking balls, the dick, the short hairs, the taint skin, and everything else. And I walk up to him, and I'm just like, Jack, why do you insist on doing this dumb internet shit, like, on, on TV, you know? And he's just like, well, if you got a problem about it, do something about it. And I was just like, man, come on, man. <laughs> you know? I'm gonna fucking kill you. <laughs> like, what are we doing, you know? And it just, you know, it's like Chael says. Sometimes he just... I can't let you get close, you know? I thought I was doing a responsible thing, you know? I didn't punch anybody. I just choked somebody a little bit. Is that, yeah, see there? He was trying to be responsible. He did not punch a single person. He just choked one little nitwit. I think that, that showed a lot of restraint, don't you, Brian? Well, again, what he said, too, is something I guess Chael Sonnen said, don't let someone get too close. And if someone's aggravated with you and they're get if they're walking towards you, if they're getting yeah. in your face, at what point do you say this guy may try to do something? I can't let that happen. I'm I'm pretty sure that they were already pretty close. And I'm thinking that maybe old Jungle Jackoff made the mistake of when he said, Well, what are you gonna do about it? He got a little bit closer and that was a little too close. What I really want to know is did Jack think he could take punk? Was there a no, second or was there a second where he fooled himself into thinking, I could take this guy? He My dad had, was on 90210. No, he had no idea in his mind because these these guys have been in a wrestling indie bubble. They've never been in the actual adult wrestling business. They don't know that people snatch each other in a locker room when they're when somebody's talking shit. And uh, Punk mentioned it on this interview in some places. He said, guys have had fights and Brett and Sean, and they go out and make money. Or baseball players or basketball players. If you're a professional athlete and you haven't been in a fight, I don't know actually what uh, how good you are because all the stars seem to do it. So, and then you go on. You don't have to make up with some dip shit that you got in a fight with at a bar, but if you're going to make a million dollars with that dip shit. But that's, uh, that's the thing is that Jungle Jack had no idea what, oh my God, he, he grabbed me. Cause they're, they don't think that they come from the land of the, the county carnival where everybody's the land of no you know, repercussions. Well, it, it's, but it's all fun on the indies with all of their friends putting on these shows and these five-star bangers. They don't understand that people would get mad about being fucking double-crossed on TV, talked about whatever. But anyway, go ahead. Responsible thing, you know? I didn't punch anybody. I just choked somebody a little bit. Samoa Joe was there. 
told me to stop. And then I quit. I turned to Tony and I said, this place is a fucking joke, man. You're a clown. I quit. I went to my room and then Joe and Jerry Lynn came and got me and they're like, let's just go out there and kill it. Let's just, and I was just too fired up and I'm fired up now and I'm probably going to regret, you know, talking about all this shit, but that's, that's what happened. What do you think of that though? Going up to Tony, uh, Tony clown. I was about to call him Tony clown. <laughs> going up to Tony God, calling up a clown saying this place is a joke. I mean, how many times does it have to be some kind of childish incident that happens that you're just standing there and it happens and nothing is ever done to, you know, send anyone to detention. And then this is a year or whatever after the goddamn press conference where Tony sat there dumbfounded with his bug eyes popping while Punk told him that, and the rest of the world, that he worked with children and they couldn't manage a target. And he still ain't got it. Punk was that, let me go. Just let me go. Oh no, I can't do that. Then... <laughs> Then tell them I'm going to stay. Oh, I can't do that. What the fuck? He's in numerous times. Uh, fix this. Settle it. Squash it. Get us together. Kenny's lawyer said, don't, don't contact Kenny. Remember, we heard about that months ago. The Bucks canceled the meeting that they were supposed to have or that they was wanted for of them to have. So what the fuck? He's going to go around and front face lock some fucking people. How, how many times you got a promo doing something before you finally just say, fuck it, I'm going to do it. They didn't want him there. They didn't want anything that was going to fuck up the endless summer camp that was AEW. These guys having Tony Khan pay for an endless summer camp with no responsibility. Where nothing matters. Just do whatever you want, work with whoever you want, nothing matters. So obviously someone like CM Punk, who wants everything he does to matter... And based on what he's saying here, didn't want things around him on the show to not matter. He was a problem to them from day one. But let's go back. Uh, here's CM Punk talking about Tony's reasoning for firing him. Did you, did you have to have a conversation? Because what was told to us was you were fired with cause. So you said quit. The devil is in the details there. But did you have a conversation with Tony to say, OK, this is it. We're done. There's not going to be you have not talked to him. Really? The last time you talked to him was backstage at Wembley? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> he went on air several days later and said he's never been <laughs> afraid for his life like this. He's been going to shows for 30 years. <laughs> felt fearful for his life, for the safety of the workers. When you saw this, what is your reaction when you see this? Not only was it a, uh, it was a promo on TV, but then he also spoke to the crowd, right? There was a, a, a clip that surfaced of him talking to... That's right. I forgot about that. He also went in front of the house and tried to explain himself. Yes. Yes. And he said to them, I was afraid for my life. And here's the thing. And we said this also, you can go back and listen to any of our clips contemporaneously at the time. One of two things, either the substandard legal advice that Tony was getting from his in-house crack legal counsel, and because the legal counsel might've been on crack, who knows? We, we know, we, we don't have any reason to believe that they were on crack for the uh, legal record. Well, no, it, no, not for the legal record. Uh, but so, Tony, if you fire him, you've got to say because you were scared for your life, because you can testify to that in case it comes to it, because he might sue us because we're fucking him. Or some of his little buddies, Tony's little buddies, got together and said, well, you know, the fans are going to be mad, but tell them that he's just a crazy maniac going around beating people up and you got scared for your life because people were in danger in the back. And then the, at least all of our gutless little pussy fans will have sympathy for you over that or both. I think either one of those or both is why Tony Khan went out there with that deer in the headlights look and those unblinking eyes and said, I was scared for my life because somebody called you a clown, Tony. Ooh. I think it was an attempt to try to put something in the field to block a CM yeah. Punk lawsuit. I think that's yeah. what it was. The lawyer said, this would be really helpful if you go on TV and say, you were really scared for your life behind the monitor at uh, Gorilla at Wembley in front of all these people that were there that worked for you that wouldn't let anything bad ever happen to you. You were so frightened you didn't yes. know what to do. Yes. And I didn't mean to insinuate that any members of the legal staff may have been on crack. I don't even... 
I'm just thinking that maybe some of the people were getting some crack from the legal staff, but nevertheless, you never. It could nowadays it could be pink cocaine, but let's go back to CM Punk. The people in your town, right? I, I believe it was in uh, in Chicago, mm. just outside. Yeah. When when you saw that version of the story being put out, what is your reaction? Um, I mean, I can't tell you what Tony felt or what he was thinking, but I never did anything that would make him fear for his life. But. You know, he's a nut. He's, he's, he's who he is. <laughs> Did you feel like your reputation was being slandered? Uh, you know, of course. Of someone course. hears that and you think, I'll be honest. Again, this is the first time we've heard him do an interview on any of this stuff. Everyone else has been running their mouth about everything. He may have talked to some reporters, you know, on background, but this is the first time we've heard Punk's voice on any of this. And that's the thing is that every time one of these incidents would happen, it seems like that the, the party line over there on the AEW side would be out instantly with numerous people to quote unquote corroborate. But yet it would be like a day later, the real story would be whispered by a rumor or whatever, because punk wasn't out there fucking screaming to all of the goddamn alleged reporters on Twitter. What his side of the story was, it had to go through the, the, the telephone, telegraph, tele-wrestler back channel of, no, what really happened was, imagine what this dipshit did. And then you found out what was really going on. Let's go back to Ariel Hawani and CM Punk. To be honest, I hear, like, I hear that, and I like, did Punk attack Tony? Yeah, I know, and everyone's like, oh my God, think of the billionaires. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, they're very much uh, as a part of, there's a concerted <laughs> effort to... Um, <laughs> I guess, slander me and try to ruin my character and stuff like that. Like, and it, that's kind of the genesis of all the drama, you know, like, don't do that. Don't, why are you doing that to a guy who works for your company? Why are you lying? Why are you spreading rumors and lies and, and bullshit about your top guy? It doesn't make any sense. You're only hurting yourself. Boom. You're trying to that's, that's what we were saying all along. That's what everybody that, had half a brain was saying, now that you've got this golden goose from the start, there were already the rumblings and Cole Caban. I don't care if CM Punk walked in the first day after signing his contract and said, I would like to see Colt Cabana disemboweled in the middle of the fucking ring tonight at five o'clock. They should have done it. Cause who the fuck is Colt Cabana? Good God. <sighs> Well, let's go back to this. There is a quote that everyone's talking about coming up. The dim my st I don't know, you know, jealousy, envy. I, I don't, I don't really know. And again, it's not really the time to, to litigate it all and everything, but like, it's an unfortunate situation. Um, I have a lot of friends there and there's a lot of good people that work there. I hope they continue to get paid. Um, and I wish them well. How would you describe what it's like working for Tony? <sighs> Man, it's a loaded question, you know, because... I don't want this to be, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like the drama, you know, but I mean, it's the, the truth is the truth. Like he's, he, he's not a boss. He's, he, he's a nice guy, you know? And I think ultimately that is a detriment to the, the company, but it's not my company. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an outsider. I thought I was brought in to, you know, sell, merchandise and tickets and draw you know numbers for pay-per-views and stuff and i clearly did that and but that's not what the place was about and some people didn't like that what does that tell you and it, well it it i mean it's not like we haven't seen this it's not like if you haven't been following this business for a while that you can't look at what they're doing and see what's going on but a lot of people wouldn't believe us until a lot more people start saying it well, Jim, yeah. another topic that everyone's been talking about are the issues with Hangman Page. and the Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I thought that this was a very calmly, reasonably thought out reason for not trusting this fucking crooked dipshit. Because, again, you can't, you can't just have somebody go out there on live television when you're supposed to be working together to garner interest in a pay-per-view main event and just start doing some tirade that, number one, 
not only do the fans not really get, but that you don't get. You don't understand what he's fucking talking about half the way. And that you, the guy was not talented enough verbally to make any of it make sense in any context, much less a double entendre co context. And we talked about that when the time came up. We said, what the fuck was he talking about? Now we know he was trying to put CM Punk on the spot verbally on live television when he was unaware and thought that everything was okay, which is the same as punching somebody in the face on the finish and, and double-crossing them. But <laughs> Hangman Page to try to out-joust verbally CM Punk, is that one of the more ridiculous mismatches in the history of fucking television? Well, again, he was mealy mouth, and we didn't even understand what he was trying to say. Even whatever yeah. point he was trying to make, he did a bad job of making it. He didn't and make that, a point. And that's what I'm... Why would you even think, I? this is a good idea for me to do? I'm not going to look like a fucking idiot doing this to CM Punk. I can't imagine why Paige thought that somehow he didn't care about what the fans thought or if he didn't care if the fans understood it. He was doing it for an audience of the locker room from fucking Rosita. Well, and as we'll hear here, I uh, hear twice there, as we'll hear here, they talked about what they were going to do before they went out there and plans changed on the spot. Let's go to this. How this all started. So then we go to the, the feud with Hangman Page, right? Adam Page. And it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, when you debut in August of 2021, up until like the spring of 2022, it's pretty good times, right? You have that I, great... I thought so, yeah. But then when he says, I'm not here to just, you know, fight you, I'm here to protect you or protect the locker room from you, right? Yeah. In so many words. And the story is that he, you know, went off script, so to speak, and really pissed you off by saying that. Did you feel like that was the first time that your reputation, that your character was being slandered? What, what he said didn't, it, it didn't, it didn't matter to me. But um, when you sit, you know, peeling, peeling the curtain back, ladies and gentlemen, and again, let me say something. This is something he mentioned multiple times in this interview, Jim. He's uncomfortable doing, even though he's doing it here. Yeah. He's still uncomfortable with the idea of talking about behind the scenes in front of the camera. Well, you know, one of the comments that he made was, he, you know, everybody's talking about pipe bombs or shoot promos. He never, and if you think about this, it's true. He never says anything that exposes the business itself. He refers to shit that fans know is true in some way or says things they know that he's, not supposed to say on television, uh, but he doesn't expose the business in any of his interviews. And, you know, and I don't blame him for it's, I mean, it's stupid anyway, but it's like nuclear disarmament. You know, it's, it's past the point of where anybody's going to give anything up, but he's the only one with a proper outlook on it. That's a problem when the boss doesn't have one, but let's go back to CM Punk talking about the issues with Hangman Page or the origin of the issues. And if you want to believe all the bad things about me, please do. Just leave me alone. Um, if I'm working with you and we sit and we talk and, you know, like I, I think one of the biggest criticisms about WWE was it's overly scripted. Mm. There's writers, you know, pro wrestlers don't need writers. Some people don't. Some people do. Some people prefer it, right? It's... You know, uh, but I sat down with him and we hammered, I was very gracious, hammered out this promo. Oh, if you say this, what if you say this? Okay, I'll say this. Oh, if you say that, I'll say this. Okay, great. Great. Yeah, awesome. Great. And then he proceeds to go on live TV and not say any of the shit that we talked about. <laughs> I can't hear him because the crowd's so loud and I'm looking at him and I have to really pay attention to what he's saying because my responses matter. I can't just say what I had planned because it's not going to match what he's saying to me. And he's Bingo. saying some shit, and I don't know what he's talking about. And I'm just like, man, why would you... If you remember the promo, just the look, Punk was kind of leaned over a little bit. Almost like he was half listening and half looking yes. at the mouth of Adam Page to try to see what he's saying. Well, and, and also one of his comments, pay, or Punk's comments to Page was, man, I, I don't know where you're coming from or why you're saying these things. Because he's like, what the fuck are you doing? You do this. Why would you, why would you ruin... TV is very expensive. You know, every minute of TV is hundreds of thousands of dollars between production and all that stuff. And you're just shitting on me and you're shitting on the business. Why would you do this? And 
I knew the promo ended with him punching me. And there's very, I had to fight the, just double leg him, just double leg. Why, why is he doing this? I don't know what's going on, but I was a professional. And afterwards, I spoke to him and I was like, why'd you do that? And, you know, <laughs> he thinks I got one of his friends um, who hasn't been fired, fired. But I went to Boom! Tony. Boom! <laughs> All that, and again, has anybody overlooked the fact that Colt Cabana, whose best years that he never had to begin with are far behind him, and he was just patient zero for comedy fucking wrestling, has still been drawing a check from Tony Khan for five years. You never see him. Nobody misses him. But he's still getting paid. He wasn't fired. The only time he was on the goddamn television, whether Punk was there or not, is when the friends brought him back to put him on one week after Punk was gone just to get back at Punk. And Jericho. And Jericho. Remember Jericho had the match with him. Yes. Well, I mean, all the friends. And because Jericho's a fake friend, he'll he's latched on because that's his retirement plan. So, again, the whole thing was bullshit. But that's probably, to save face, what Colt Cabana was going around and telling, well, they'd put me on TV if he wasn't here. Yeah, no, they wouldn't put you on TV because you suck. Fuck. Anyway, I'm sorry. Editorial time. And the lawyer, and I said, you need to fix that. Because if I do, you're not going to like the way I fix it. And I thought I was being professional by not just murdering him on television. <laughs> you know? Uh, it's, uh, sorry, I know I know some people are going to be upset about that. And some people are going to be like, oh, he's talking about this guy again. Uh, but with me, respect is the default. I respect everybody until you do something that makes me lose my respect for you. And I had never done anything to any of those guys. If they're basing how their attitude is towards me based on some bullshit their friend told them, well, I can't help you. But I got plenty of friends who don't like certain people and I keep relationships business. Right. Right. Uh, and yeah, that's the, uh, everything went off the rails from there. It's that's, a shame. And that's really where everything, I mean, there were incidents before that. The Bobby fish match is one that people look at, but punk was mostly tied up in this feud with MJF, which was the, maybe the highlight of AEW's five years so far, that feud. Yeah. As soon as that feud ended and he had the mix with Jen pop, you know, all of a sudden <laughs> there were some issues. And, you know, but again, it's nice to hear a responsible, reasonable adult in a wrestling business tell what happened. He didn't want bullshit, but he wasn't going to put up with bullshit. He didn't want to fucking punch people, but he had exhausted all of the, the opportunities for requests he had to the guy running the fucking company to do something about the children that were slandering him. And he'd ask to be let go. <laughs> and he did what the, what the fuck else could he have done at that point? You won't let me go. You won't stop these fucking assholes. You won't get everybody together and come to fucking Jesus. Lord knows we're not ever going to work and take advantage of this by making you some money. So what the fuck else was there left? But him just say, tell you what, next time you do that, I'm going to fucking pop you. What other... <laughs> Was he supposed to fucking no-show and just stay home? I bet he'd still got his check if he'd have done that. He would have still been paid, absolutely. Well, let's talk about this now, Jim. Let's go a little bit forward. Again, there's a lot of audio. We encourage everyone to check out the full interview on the MMA Hour. Even the little angle he shot afterwards. I don't know why he's doing angles on his show <laughs> with Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch. <laughs> well, that's so they could clip it for Raw. But, Jim, let's go to this. This is going to be Punk talking about the aftermath of everything that happened in Chicago with him and the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega brawl out, as we call it now, his relationship with AEW after that, right after that. Let's go to this. So you, yeah. so you, you go away, and it's kind of good timing because obviously you never want to get hurt, but we don't know if you're suspended, if you're hurt, if you're recovering from surgery, you just disappear. Did you ever get close to being let go at that point? You said at the beginning of all this, you said, please, you know, let's just do it here. Well, nobody in the company spoke to me for, well, I don't know, six six months? How's that possible? I don't know. I Not paid, a soul. <laughs> paid for my surgery, booked my surgery. How is that possible? How is that possible? 
Ah, I don't know. And Top he doesn't stars know injured either. under contract. No one talks to him. Well, you know, when uh, th that would normally fall under the heading of talent relations, but I understand the head of talent relations was real good friends with the Buckaroos, and that might fall under the legal, but the legal head, I understand, was quite close friends with a number of the boys, including in that camp. Um, it, it, let's see, I'm trying to think, who in charge of anything was a friend of CM Punk's besides Tony? Who was scared to call him? So, yeah, he's about to tell you, but, yeah, if he hadn't have already had history with Andrews in Birmingham, he might still be one-armed. He had to do his own surgery, his own rehab, his own goddamn everything. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Well, let's go back to this. And, again, we have a few more things we're going to play here, but here's CM Punk once again talking about after everything at Brawlout. You know, thankfully, Dr. Sampson, who I knew from WWE, I have a good rapport with, like, he helped me with that. But, like, all, I was on my own and all that stuff. And, you know, if you think I deserve to be, you know, fired or treated like that, that's your opinion. It's none of my business what you think of me. But, um, it, like, you know, doing this one and the recovery for this one, based on how the recovery went for that one, I'm just like, man, it's, it's night and day the comparison between, you know, places where there's structure. He's talking about his triceps, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when he says this one and this one. He's talking about his two different triceps interviews. Uh, interviews, uh, Injuries. <laughs> injuries. For those who haven't realized, they're two different arms that he got hurt on. It was uh, not the same arm two years in a row. But yeah, cool. and and uh, also I said Dr. Andrews. He's the guy that used to do everybody in Birmingham. He might be dead now. He no, was old alive. back then. Is he okay? Well, James good. Andrews, he's yeah. done a lot of good work. But, of course, it's Doc Samson, the man of bronze. But... Um, but also he'd book his own surgery, do his own physical therapy, et cetera. No sport from the office. That's, uh, again, he's making the statement. Now he's hurt. He's got support. He's ahead of schedule because they've got a world-class team of everybody involved in their athletes recovery. Whereas before it was, oh, he's, he's hurt. Well, we ought to call him someday. This is what we've always said. If you're a wrestler who has the choice of the two companies, you have structure, you have management, especially now with Vince out of the way, and Nick Khan is a competent executive. You can't take that away from him. You have competency on top. There's that, and then there's, we can get a bunch of money to do whatever we want, no structure, but that also means I'll show up the arena with no idea what's going on. It's a complete mess, but it's run by someone with enough money that they could just keep it floating. Now you hear what he's saying. You hear what it's like on the other side. Let's go back to this. And there's protocols and there's professional people in charge of things. And I'm not having to research and find a, a, a PT spot. You know, I had, I had no help, N like nothing. And that's insane to me. Is that how they treat the Jaguars players? I don't know. <laughs> oh, you know, hey, but, hold on. Yeah. I saw a comment. I've watched this on YouTube, the MMA Hour with Ariel Hawani. We love you, Ariel. Everybody needs to listen to this thing. But some of the comments, one of the comments was from a football fan, apparently, who said the Jaguars are, they, the league did some kind of survey with the players of how they felt, that, and how they rated their treatment by their team with certain things like the food and the medical care of the family, the way they take care of the families. And the Jaguars got Ds and Fs in everything and said that actually because they couldn't give a grade to the player's family room because there's not one provided, so they've seen players' wives breastfeeding their kids on the floor of the public bathroom. So that's how they treat the Jaguars. So maybe if you're a football player, you might ought to steer clear of that thing too. We've been hearing more and more stories about this function with the Jaguars lately. And again, the problem is, if you're a baseball fan, Tony Khan is Jeff Wilpon. The really rich, successful guy put his kid who's been rich because his dad is rich in charge of the things he likes, that he loves, and he's not good at it. But he loves them. Well, let's go back to CM Punk. Again, there's a lot of audio here. Let's go to CM Punk talking about when he returned to AEW right before Collision started. I guess when Collision started. Let's go to this. 
could you tell though right away? I mean, you mentioned the the Jack, you know, conversation, but could you tell right away that nothing much had changed? That it was like, was there a moment there where you're like, you know what, this could work, this no. is nice? No, no, <laughs> no. I knew it. I was like, this is it's it's never gonna work. And I, yeah, I, you can't. That's that's not the way you facilitate things. I, you know, let me just stop it there. I think part of it is, you know, how every now and then you hear about like. The girl that dates the guy because she thinks she could fix him. Yes. There's no wrestler that's going to be able to go to AEW and fix it. There's probably no human being that's going to be able to go to AEW and fix the problem, the institutional problems there. And Punk may be case zero is someone who, actually Cody, uh, before Punk, who found out the hard way. You can go in there, you can think Tony's a nice guy, you can realize he has all the money in the world. Nothing's ever going to change. The chaos is only going to become more chaotic. The bigger star you are and the more serious you are about your career and wrestling in general, the crazier you will get, the quicker that you will get there if you work there. It's for the indie guys that desperately dream about being on television. It's for the veterans who have outlived their usefulness for the WWE and want guaranteed money in the sunset of their careers. and. There's not a lot in between right now. And if poor MJF, I, I hope he's out the rest of the year. And I hope he stays undercover and doesn't speak in public and nobody hears about him because they have to forget everything they saw from him the previous six months. And then maybe he'll be free to pursue a life of religious freedom. But it, it's it's... It's either the young guys that are glad to be on TV or the old guys that are glad to get a pension. And I don't see anything in between, and that's where all the money is. Let's go back to CM Punk talking with Ariel Hawani. You know, and I always, I'll always go back to so many different stories in wrestling about people flying off the handle and socking each other and then going on to make money and... How many times does it happen on a basketball court? How many times, like it happened a couple of years ago in an NHL practice game, like the, the St. Louis Blues started beating the shit out of each other. It's just like, uh, you know, I don't know. To, to me, that's, that's life and that's where I come from. And to other people, it's like the most outrageous thing in the world. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the devil. No, you're not. It's Adam Cole. Well, no, it's not. You don't want your locker room fighting, obviously. Well, you don't want your... Uh, Tony Khan has been quoted, uh, at least has been, uh, not maybe not quoted, but it's been referenced that he said, well, you know, if the guys have some tension, it's like Brett and Sean, right? The difference is they were two professionals that stood to make a, a ton of money for the time. Even a good, good amount of money for now, but a ton of money for the time working with each other, whether they liked each other or not. And I can understand if you didn't want to work some with somebody on an indie for 500 bucks. Okay, fine. Hey, who gives a shit? But for main event pay-per-view payoffs of six figures back in those days, 25 years ago, yes, but they, they, that's, they had to be, they were adults and they were great talents and they knew what the business was. And that doesn't apply to most of the people that punk is talking about here. Well, Jim, a couple more clips here, and then we'll wrap it up once again. And the MMA Hour with Ariel Hawani. Everyone should check out this episode. Newsworthy, to say the least. Here's Punk talking about AEW's business and his role being brought in and how he thought he was brought in to make money, but what the AEW business model is really all about. Regarding your time in AEW, is there anything that you're proud of? Yeah, because I, I think people expect me to be like, bleh, bleh, burn it all down, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I made a lot of great friends there, um, which is ironic because I'm the guy that's just like, oh, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to make money. But again, the people you work with, you know, you, you, know, you wind up becoming friends with. Um, and I did, I did cool stuff. I got to work with Sting. You know, let's talk about like a weird thing. Like it's not even on the bucket list because it's just something you don't consider that is a possibility. You know, I worked, I worked with Sting in the Greensboro Coliseum. Like, it's fucking wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, 
I apologize. I accidentally <laughs> pressed the button and sped him up there. It wasn't oh. CM Punk all of a sudden speeding up. I did that, but let's go back to CM Punk. <laughs> I, I think the positives definitely outweigh, you know, the negatives. Really? It's yeah. I just I, I, I look at it more like I was <laughs> I thought I was. I thought I was coming in to to help, to help business. Um, if I could teach something, great. Uh and I I think I was just brought in for other reasons, you know, like the the, the their their business and I know a lot of people are gonna be upset. It's just not predicated. It's not a real business. It's not about- <laughs> What do you mean by that? It's not about selling tickets. It's not about drawing money. It's not about making money. It's just not. What's it about? I don't know. Really? I, I think having good matches, <laughs> maybe. And there's nothing wrong with that. I was recently at an indie show. Well, let me stop it here. He goes into some advice that he gave someone at an indie show that was actually pretty interesting. But let's talk about the big things there, that AEW is not a real business, that it's not predicated on the traditional things that professional wrestling promotions were predicated on, making money, drawing money, in the modern era, pay-per-view, merch, ticket sales. Even if you want to believe it's all about just the rights fee, you still can't pretend that it, this has all been run right. And just because Tony had hundreds of millions of dollars to throw at this, you can't pretend that there weren't ways he could have been more successful, even with his success. Well, but again, for the people say, well, it's all about the rights fee renewal. Well, you got to have the ratings to get that, or the better ratings you get, the more renewal you're going to get, right? I mean, you know, and, and then... Why are the fans sitting there going, well, it's all about the rights fee if the program sucks? If the, I mean, Heaven's Gate, is that too old of a reference now? That's that's recent history to me. But they poured $100 million or whatever it was in a rotten movie. I was going to say the movie or the cult. Well, no, the movie. You know, you, you can have all the money in the world and still make a bad fucking show. So it, it, so I don't know why that the fans say, well, if only they get the the renewal, then they can keep doing this. It's it keeps sucking. The show is bad. It is not not good. And if the ratings are not good because the show is not good, then the renewal will not be good. This kind of all works hand in hand, and the network doesn't give a shit if fucking. What's one of their goddamn darlings? If the goddamn, you Charles know, uh, uh, no, the, the acclaimed, oh, have a fucking I think eight, the network. No, I'm saying the the network doesn't care if the acclaimed have an eight star match with goddamn uh, light switch white and poor old juice. We hardly knew ye. They don't care. They just care if people are watching, and they ain't gonna watch if it ain't any good, and they're already quitting watching. Because it ain't any good. Well, Jim, let's go to CM Punk. This may be the last clip we play from this interview. Asked if he thinks that AEW will continue to exist in the future. Do you think they'll be around, like, given the fact that you say, like, it's... Oof. Will they be around in... This is a loaded question. Uh, I think... No, it's... I, it's I, two, you, like, the company? Yeah. As a whole? Yeah. I think it, it's always going to exist as long as Tony wants to put money into it. Okay. There you have but it. Can they be as successful? Like, do you feel like they're trending? Do you watch them even? What's successful though? Like, what's the yeah, definition? Of, see, this is and this is what I'm talking about. Like levels, you know, because like I started on the indies, and to me, successful was uh, I can eat tonight. I have gas money to get to wherever I was going, and man, I, golly, I had a good match, you know. And then you know you get to television, and as somebody coming in who doesn't know jack shit about doing television, like I have to lean on people and ask questions and watch and learn and grow. And a lot of people I think are still just stuck in that indie mindset. And again, it's where I came from. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you're more happy with some goof saying that you had a five-star match and the building's a quarter full, we're not in the same business. Right. Well, there, there you is. have it. There it is.
And and before I forget to say this, because a lot of people are going, wow, Carnat likes those 15-minute headlocks they had back in the 90s or whatever the, the line is. No, we and I've always talked about, boy, we had a great match with the Rock and Roll Express. We had a great match with the Southern Boys, or it was a pleasure to work with so-and-so, right? You're supposed to want to have good matches too. You're supposed to want the angles and the promos that you do about the match you have with an opponent you want them to sell tickets and to create interest and then you go and you have a good match with the opponent that they're already interested in so that maybe you can have a rematch and get them to come back and buy another ticket you're not trying to suck at any step of the equation but if just as we've said so many times just because a guy can have a good match and can do all the moves, if he was a goddamn wallpaperer and that was working on the arena and you just had him walk in in front of all the people and do the moves like a professional can, people would go, well, that's a bunch of shit. You, got to, you can't have one of the part of the equation. You've got to have all in a nice little mixture and to be honest, it's great to have a great match, especially when you have an opponent that you can make magic with that, that you know, works like the Midnight Rock and Roll or whatever. But the, the, the getting them interested in who you are, who they are, and why you are fighting them is more important than the match you have. But they're all important. But everybody has lost sight of... You've got... The Nick Waynes of the world, I'm a droop-faced teenage knucklehead with no body and no ability to cut a fucking promo and no goddamn star look, and I might get over in a small territory, but they don't have those anymore, so now I'm on national TV and it looks ridiculous. But I can do a fucking moonsault. You got too many of those, I'm sorry. Yeah, everybody should be able to live their dream. But <laughs> not on television, playing parts that you are not goddamn equipped for. So what if all the fucking porn actresses were 280 pounds and fat and had warts on their nose? How much money would they make? And maybe the end of the porno business. It would be a specialized market, at least. We can say that. That's the point. You got to look like what you're fucking doing if you're trying to sell it to other people. We've been telling the truth about AEW since the very beginning, and it's a very inconvenient truth for a lot of AEW believers. For people that believe the AEW dream, I guess we can call it. For some people that believe what Tony Khan says, and for someone that accuses everyone else of being bad faith, Tony Khan either says nothing or is just <laughs> dishonest about shit. So you don't know who's really bad faith. But this is something we always talked about. We said one day, we said this like at the beginning, there's going to be shoot interviews and someone's going to start saying the truth about what goes on there. The chaos, the dysfunction, the lack of management, Tony's behavior. And trust me, there's so many more stories about <laughs> Tony right for the picking that'll eventually emerge. A lot of guys don't want to say anything because you always want to be able to go back someplace and get some work. Not everyone's in a position of CM Punk. But this is the first person who's really gone on the record explicitly explaining the problems with AEW, and specifically Tony Khan is the management of AEW. Well, and, you know, that it was... I think there's two sets of fans. I think there's the fans that believed in the AEW dream that, that had... Good reasons for doing that, because we all wanted a sports-based presentation of wrestling uh, uh, with a budget and TV that could be an alternative to the WWE, who were stale and phony and bleh. And so that was uh, great for people to wish for or want or hope to see. But for there are some element of the fans there that still think that this goddamn trained chimpanzee wrestling that Maddie and Nikki have shepherded into our midst 
is going to get over with anybody instead of being a goddamn, you know, everybody's source of sour belches. And it's child, silly, phony fucking wrestling. That is why the wrestling fans are offended because they don't want what they liked all those years being a bunch of phony bullshit with children. And that's why the normal people don't start watching this show because they look at these guys and they go, who the fuck does he think he's kidding? This guy's going to beat somebody up or how phony can that be? Or these guys are horrible actors or all the things that your average people say when they see bad indie wrestling. And that's what they, they've got the same, a little bit less than the same group they always had to begin with. And that's kind of trickling off and they haven't got anybody else new except when they had Punk because he was the one that could grab the wrestling fan, the mainstream fan, the WWE fan, or just an adult that didn't want to see stupid fucking kids playing stupid fucking games. And the guys who just wanted to play with their friends, it's the same friends. It's the same friends that were on the indies with them six years ago. It's one of the reasons everything's so stale. You'd think Muffin Top Taylor's skin condition would have cleared up by then. Now, he wasn't released. Lots of other people have been released, but he wasn't released. No, he, he escaped, but they brought him back. Before we end this segment, though, I think that's one of the issues with the release thing that I brought up earlier. AEW had a bunch of things they put out there to try to make themselves publicly seem different than WWE. We're going to pay women the same as men. We're going to have health insurance. Those were early things that went away quick. Sports-based wrestling, again, something that went away very quick. Very quick. Tony Khan has bragged, I want to say maybe in the last year, maybe a little bit longer, but he's talked about that they don't release people. That's why it was a big deal when Kevin Kelly got fired recently. Wow, they fired nobody. Nobody gets released. Jelly Nutella and all those people that won their contract for months and did nothing on TV. They ghosted that the same way they ghosted CM Punk. <laughs> Turns out this an AEW way. When they're done with you for a while, no one talks to you. That's a weird thing. But they just release people for the first time. It's interesting. Is this a sign that they're going to start taking things a little more seriously with their new COO? They're actually releasing people. We'll see. I mean, well, I'm, again, it's do, a do fiscally we... irresponsible operation. And until people admit that, the idea that you start a business to lose tens if not over a hundred million dollars whatever it may be right now just to eventually get to the point where you're going to get a television rights renewal but meanwhile you're you're driving the popularity of your company down through the presentation and the booking and everything else it's stupidity it's stupidity but tony said it and the people who like tony want to believe it brian you have just made me realize that tony khan did Learn everything he knows from me, only he's taken it to new heights. He's magnified it. He is, it's, it's exponentially grown from what I taught him to what he's done now. Because what's one of my favorite homilies about the wrestling business? Uh, if you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. No. You know, the easiest way to make $5 million in the wrestling business Start with 10 million. <laughs> and he's taking it to a whole new level. He did learn from me. And we can say that without fear of contradiction now. Well, there it is, Jim. And we will now end this very, very long segment. We didn't even get to review everything CM Punk talks about running into Vince McMahon. And then gives but, his but opinions. But not in his car, unfortunately. And says more about Vince McMahon in a negative light than anyone else who's been interviewed about this from the company has so far. And says... He ruined his life by ruining the lives of others, and that's a pretty good way of looking at it, I guess. Yeah, well, and the one comment he made also that was the first thing that I thought was, obviously, you don't, you knew Vince was weird. We, we've said this. We, you know people are weird, but you never imagine somebody's going to do that, right? But he, Punk said the first thing he brought up that he was shocked about was that Vince McMahon, no matter what you think of him, having known the guy, was stupid enough to put all that shit in writing. And that's, I mean, but, you know, he said, 
And and I agree with him. Vince McMahon ruined his life, his legacy, the way he'll be remembered. He ain't going to live long enough to redeem himself with polite society. And he did it to himself by ruining other people's lives in the process. So, holy fuck. Well, there it is. What will certainly be a very, very busy week, week and a half with WrestleMania and all the other things happening around the world of wrestling. CM Punk on Ariel Hawani's MMA Hour. Check it out wherever you find your favorite uh, MMA Hour. But we will now return back to your normally scheduled drive through And my time machine's off. So we will return with Time Machine on the other side. <laughs> 